being back in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 tonight. We, uh, we'll be looking again to Romans 9, verses 4 through 5, but do a little review again this, this afternoon about what we are talking about this morning. Now we're going to talk about the application of Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 to Reformed theology or replacement theology. And this is the intent of Romans 9, 10, and 11 so that what we know as Reformed or replacement theology would never happen. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? The vast majority of Christianity today is Reformed. <clears throat> Now, uh, they get upset when we as Baptists say, well, we're, we aren't part of the Reformation. We just go right to the Bible. We don't, we're not trying to reform anything. Uh, that's not what we're about. But when we understand Reformed theology, you have books like the book of Hebrews, the book of Galatians, First and Second Peter. Certainly, if you have these books in the Bible, we wouldn't have anybody trying to practice a form of the Mosaic Covenant today or its corruptions that would continue to be in Christianity. It's addressed so much scripturally already. Uh, certainly, Romans chapter 7, we have the same uh, thing there, that we're not under the Mosaic Covenant anymore. Why, then, is, re is replacement theology or reform theology so much uh, predominantly uh, captivated Christianity? Well, because there's a devil in the world. Amen. And uh, he's still corrupting the truth, and hath God said, he's still questioning it, and all of the things that go along with it. Well, let's talk about, first of all, what is replacement or reformed theology? Reformed or replacement theology which again is a vast majority of professing Christianity, both mysticism and sacramentalism, those two words go, to, words go together, mysticism. All sacramental churches are mystical. Otherwise, they're things that we can't understand. Um, and the sacraments, are, you know, we can't understand what's going on there. So, But mysticism and sacramentalism believes, first of all, that national Israel was replaced with the church, this universal entity called the church. It's theonomic in its purposes. Otherwise, the intent is for us to build the kingdom on earth. That's Out of that comes amillennialism and even some forms of millennialism. And this, of course, is what Augustine was, his preterism, the doctrine of preterism. Otherwise, that everything... That is, all prophecy happened within the first 1,000 years. Today we are already in the kingdom, and uh, Christ is reigning through the church today. That's all millennialism, not literally. So they believe Judaism is replaced, supposed to be replaced there with Christianity, and all the promises of God to national Israel are now transferred to some ambiguous Universal Church, well, you, which universal church is it? The State Church of Germany, which is Lutheranism. The State Church of England, which is Anglican or Episcopalian. How about the State Church of Spain or Brazil, which is Roman Catholic? These churches are all supported by tax dollars within their countries. And uh, well, which of these universal churches is it? Well, that's ecumenicism. Ecumenicism doesn't make any difference. This is the great whore and the mother of harlots in the book of Revelation. Now, membership, always becoming part of this universal church, which is usually a national or state church, is what they believe is being joined to a covenant relationship with God in replacement theologies, redefining of the Mosaic Covenant. So these people falsely believe circumcision as a sign of being part of the covenant is replaced with infant baptism, whereby infants and children are guaranteed access to the covenant 
through the faith of their parents by whose faith they are given infant baptism. So you're baptized vicariously through your parents' faith. Now, none of this is in the Bible, right? I've challenged people to say, well, show me that in the Bible. Where, where is that? It's not there. But this is replacement theology. So these people falsely believe that under replacement theology, God's grace is conferred through the hands of ordained clergymen through sacrament to the participants in those sacraments. So in the sacraments, there's grace being conferred. Forgiveness of sin, the cleansing of sin, regeneration uh, through water, all of these things are being conferred through the hands of ordained clergymen, or this is a doctrine of orders, which is part of Roman Catholicism. Reformed churches all have a variation of those kind of things uh, within Reformed churches. So that is why we have Christ saying he hates the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which is a clergy laity division, because of the priesthood of all believers. Now Romans 9, 10, and 11 are correcting all of this stuff. It already existed in early Christianity in what was called Judaism. That's what Paul addressed in Galatians and uh, Book of Hebrews uh, extensively. But under this system then, a child is then catechized and confirmed. You all heard of confirmation. How many of you, uh, when you were part of the nominal ch the denominational church, went to confirmation? I did. Uh, so you're catechized or you're confirmed by instruction after which then he or she then is allowed to receive Christ in receiving the elements of the sacrament of the Eucharist or communion also. We call it Lord's Supper. Biblically is what it is. So in receiving the elements of the Lord's Supper, the body and body of Christ, the body and blood of Christ, they're literally receiving Christ. Isn't it amazing every time the scripture talks about something spiritual, liturgical churches make it physical, and when it's talking about something physical, they make it spiritual. So in order to retain or ensure salvation under Reformed theology, the individual must live morally, be faithful to attendance in church services, receiving the grace of forgiveness through the sacrament of confession in Calvinism or in Catholicism or the sacrament of Holy Communion whereby you are receiving forgiveness of sin uh, and of course re-crucifying Christ. In other words, salvation and its retention are dependent upon the church, physical membership and faithfulness to the sacraments. Now most people don't understand any of that. They're just doing what they are told that they're supposed to do. So they go to church and have their stuff done to them or for them, not knowing or understanding anything about it. And they don't have to because it's mystical. And even if we tried to explain it to you, you couldn't understand it. That's mysticism. And that is why these churches, that's all part of replacement theology. Now, this is a little difficult to, to for many people, I think, who's never heard these things to understand, but they're the foundation of what's being addressed in Romans 9, 10, and 11. And it's being addressed because these were the issues that had been corrupted by the priesthood of Israel in their corruption of the Mosaic Covenant, making it and adding it to the, the Abrahamic Covenant as a means of both salvation, grace plus, uh, what God had offered. Now, okay, therefore, in application, since Romans cha uh, chapter 9, 10, and 11 negate and correct the corruptions of the Mosaic Covenant by Judaism, <coughs> <coughs> these corruption were transferred into, which of course is sastra dodalism. Sastra means sacrifices. Dodalism is priesthood, sacrifices by the priest. Those chapters also negate the variations in corruption of salvation solely by grace through faith that exist in Reformed or Replacement theology and their corruptions of Christianity and then through sacramentalism with clergy and sacrament. 
The Old, Old Testament was priest and sacrifices. New Testament, it's clergy and sacraments. Now, there's, there's a corruption going on here. Now, Romans 9, 10, and 11 are intended to correct that corruption. It hadn't even been created yet, but the corruptions already existed in Judaism. We would have never thought that with the number of scriptures we have addressing this issue, Hebrews, Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, uh, the whole book of Hebrews, First and Second Peter, we have these books addressing this issue. How in the world could this stuff come into Christianity? Well, the only way that can happen is you just ignore those books or you teach around them or you make them say something else and you begin to read, interject, uh, interpose these heresies within the Christianity. And they are dependent upon the ignorance of the people. And people don't really want to study these things out for themselves. They trust their authoritarians, their teachers, just as Israel did, trusted their priesthood. So let's look at a little bit of foundation for this. Now, I know this is heavy stuff, but it's all important for you to know. First of all, Augustinianism. This is around 300 A.D., which is Roman Catholic doctrine, Augustinianism, was reformed originally by a man by John Huss. Now, John Huss was the first reformer, but he retained the sacramental view, the mystical view of the sacraments. <clears throat> then, about 100 years later, a Martin Luther comes on the scene. Now, he is often credited to be the father of the Reformation, but John Huss really is the father of it. Uh, Reformed theology of these men then retained most of Augustine's Roman Catholic theology with, with just a few changes or reforms. Luther took away five of the sacraments and reduced them to two. But the, remember, there are no sacraments. Huss did the same thing. He reduced them to two, maybe three, uh, retaining the sacrament of marriage, which is not a sacrament. Luther now totally agreed with Augustine on total depravity, perhaps even expanding upon Augustine's theology of total depravity in Luther's book called The Bondage of the Will. Now John Calvin comes along and he just restates most of Augustine's theology. He agreed with, uh, with his predecessor, Luther, on total depravity, and that came into Calvinism. So the doctrine of state church, he agreed with that. Uh, he agreed with the sacraments, uh, monergism or sovereign grace. God regenerates you before you uh, get saved, giving you the gift of faith and uh, repentance, whereby you will not be able to resist the grace of God, and one day you will trust in Christ. All of that comes into Calvinism. And although there are numerous variations of error within Reformed theology, Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, now get this, addresses all of the so-called reformations of these years. So if you have these three chapters and you understand them, you can address every single one of them. Now Romans chapter 9 certainly addresses the issue of election being salvational. Not all they who were elect Israel were of the promise, but they, they who are of the promise. So the text does address all the principal errors of replacement theology, Romans 9, 10, and 11. And uh, all these chapters teach that to be spiritually blessed with Abraham is being part of spiritual or born-again Israel. All people must stand apart from any trust in producing their own righteousness through keeping the law or through participation in some religious ritual like circumcision. That's not part of it. In no, other words, it's... Galatians addresses that. So to be spiritually blessed with Abraham, one must be like Abraham in one specific, and that specific is faith in the promised one, which is Christ. And rebirth coming through faith in what he, his death, burial, and resurrection and his accomplishment. Now let me ask you a question before we go on. If infant baptism places circumcision, can women be saved?
Can women be made part of the covenant if there's no circumcision for women? Now you think about this for a little bit. But this is what's being taught today. And uh, of course, we baptize, infant baptize little girls. But that's, if that's replacing circumcision, then there's something wrong. There's a difference here. So therefore, with the understanding that Romans chapter 9 has two elect Israels in view, national, spiritual, or born-again Israel, we can begin to understand Paul's statements in verses 4 through 5. Nowhere in Scripture does election pertain to salvation. Nowhere. No one is ever chosen to be saved while those unchosen are predestined to eternal damnation without any hope of ever being, uh, ever being saved. That's uh, called pretemporal reprobation under Calvinism. Before time, God has chosen all those who will be saved, and before time, God has reprobated all that are not elect to an eternal hell, and they can never be saved. Taking choice completely out of the map. Now, Romans 9, 4 through 5, we'll read this and have a word of prayer. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and of the promises? Whose are the fathers? These promises, whose are the fathers? And of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Now, this is the eternality of the Abrahamic covenant. Our Father, as we bow and ask, Lord, that you would give us understanding of these truths. Help us to learn them that we might help others who are imprisoned in this work, this cult of works. And it encompasses, we know, Lord, the vast majority of those who call themselves Christian today, but certainly are not. And we pray for them and ask, Lord, for your help in teaching them and reaching them with the gospel of Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Now, the word Israelites here. Now, where the church never becomes Jews. You have to be a physical descendant of Abraham to be a Jew. You can be a faith descendant of Abraham through being born again. Now, that's a difference. But the church will always be separate from the nation of Israel. We'll be grafted into the nation of Israel as a new priesthood. But we have no connection to the land promises of Israel. Just as the priesthood of the Old Testament had no connection to the land promises of Israel. They received a tithe of all to compensate them for the lack that they did not have real estate. And uh, that is true of the priesthood of all believers. Now, there are Jews who are Christians who in the kingdom age will rule uh, over the world. But the fact that they are Christians and part of the church make them superior in position to national Israelites who will be born again to the beginning of the kingdom of age. Otherwise, they will rule over their own people during the kingdom age. Now, there will be Jews, physical descendants, and they'll be part of national Israel, but they'll hold a more predominant position as the 12 apostles uh, who will rule over the 12 tribes of Israel. So the word Israelites distinguishes the descendants of both Abraham, national Israel, and spiritual Israel, according to the Abrahamic covenant, as a covenant is a uh, name of the chosen people. That's the Israelites. Now there are conditions of election for both national Israel and spiritual Israel. <coughs> the condition to be part of elect national Israel is a physical birth of genetic descendancy from Abraham. My grandmother is a Jew. My great-grandmother was a Jewish lady. Um, Rosenstiel was her name. Uh, my grandmother, of course, gave birth to my father and his uh, brother and aunt because my grandmother was Jewish, not a Jew. She was Pentecostal, actually. But uh, her son, two sons and daughter would have been considered Jewish. My mother was not Jewish. So, strictly speaking, under Jewish practices, I would not be Jewish because my mother's not Jewish, even though my father's Jewish. Uh, that's the way they account these things. You must have a 
matriarchal connection to Israel in order to be considered a Jew. <clears throat> so in this context, I don't know how this all works out in God's plan, but that's how Israel has worked it all together. Uh, if, you want, if you're going to be considered or counted as a Jew, you have to have your mother has to be Jewish. So uh, the condition of this whole part of national Israel is a physical birth genetic connection from Abraham. And the condition to be part of the spiritual Israel is a spiritual birth by grace through faith. Again, if you're part of the church now, you're going to be part of, uh, if you're Jewish, you'll be part of national Israel. But you will have a superior position in the kingdom age uh, as the apostles and all church age believers will rule the world uh, as a church age. So adoption pertains to both groups. But adoption doesn't mean to take a stranger and make them your child. Adop adoption in the Bible means to be placement as an adult son. Uh, the placement of maturity. And it's from the Greek word here, uh, Othea, uh, the same word used in Romans 8, 23, defined there <coughs> as well. And not only they, but also, also which have the first fruits of the Spirit. <coughs> Even we ourselves, grown with ourselves, waiting for the adoption. Now, if we've been adopted already, why would we be waiting for it? The point is the adoption is told here what it is. The redemption of the body. That is the ultimate place of maturity when we are delivered from sin nature itself <coughs> and delivered into glory. So the word adoption refers to the redemption of the body or glorification. National Israel experienced physical redemption from Egyptian bondage, but that's not the same as spiritual redemption. Well, don't confuse those things. In Exodus chapter 6, verse 1, we say, well, you know, God delivered the national Israel from Egyptian bondage, so therefore redemption means they're all saved. No, that redemption is physical, not, not spiritual. <coughs> Every Jew had to spiritually get saved. So verse 1, it says in, in, in Exodus 6, it says, The Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I'm the Lord, I'm, I'm Jehovah, <coughs> and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty, and by my name Jehovah was I known to them. And I've also established my covenant with them to give them the land of the Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I've also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, <coughs> excuse me, who the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Now, don't confuse actual with types. Remember, this is a type, physical. Redemption is type of spiritual redemption. So wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will dream, redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments, and I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am the Lord, your God. <coughs> <coughs> which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land concerning the which I, I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. And I'll give it to you for a heritage. I am the Lord. Now this is a promise of a physical redemption. Don't assume it's a spiritual redemption. Otherwise simply physical. They still needed to get saved. And Moses spake so unto the children of Israel that they hearkened not unto Moses for the anguish of spirit and for a cruel bondage. And so there was still some resistance for that. Now they did that in the wilderness too. They said, well, you took us out of this place where 
We had all the food we could, we wanted to eat, even though we were under slavery, and we had a roof over our head, and uh, <clears throat> you know all the things that we needed. At least, even though we were in slavery, uh, we had everything we needed. <clears throat> and you bring us out here into the wilderness in the desert where there's no water, there's no food, and, and God was going to teach him a lesson to, to depend, depend, depend on Him. Now, why is all this important? Because we're learning why Romans 9, 10, and 11 from the Bible. It's a serious error to presume that every Jew redeemed from Egyptian bondage was also spiritually saved, born again. It's quite obvious that this was not the case. That's what Romans 9 is talking about. The redemption from Egyptian bondage was merely a physical salvation from physical slavery and a physical deliverance. And although this redemption from Egyptian bondage was typical of spiritual salvation and deliverance, it was not actual spiritual salvation and deliverance. Now We need to understand that. That's important for us to understand. In fact, most of these guys came out of Egyptian bondage complaining and murmuring in the wilderness and, and uh, really in more unbelief than they had belief because most of them came out mixed multitude. Now, you don't have to be intermixed with the Egyptians by marriage to come out of mixed multitude. Most people that come into Baptist churches when they get saved come as mixed multitude. Uh, they bring a lot of the baggage with them that came from their previous form of replacement Christianity. By the way, it's not replacement Christianity at all. There's nothing Christian about it in many cases other than they talk about Christ. So spiritual Israel, all of those that are born again by grace through faith and depending promised one, receive spiritual redemption from the bondage of death. However, this redemption goes beyond the deliverance from the power of death and eternal condemnation. This deliverance delivers the believer into eternity and into the regeneration in a glorified body. That's what Romans chapter 8 is all about. But in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, the word of God says this. Now, this is why Hebrews is an important epistle. Luther hated the book of Hebrews. He didn't think it was even inspired. He didn't think it should be in the Bible. Uh, he didn't like it. Didn't like the book of Revelation much either. But uh, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14, he says, For as much then, as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death, this time about Christ, he might destroy him that had power of death, that is a devil. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. This is spiritual deliverance, spiritual redemption. And the doctrine of the kinsman redeemer in the Old Testament law is intended to be typical of the spiritual redeemer of Christ. And our kinsman redeemer, Jesus, had to be both God and man. <clears throat> he had to be man in order to be our kinsman redeemer. He had to be God because he was sinless and perfect. He could not be born of, Abra of Adam. He must be born purely of God. 1 Corinthians 15, of course, in verse 53, the resurrection chapter of Scripture, he says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. That's a new body. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Well, the sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. That's what keeps you in bondage. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's great truth here. We've been passed from death unto life already. That's our, our promise of, of, of Christ. So adoption, as we see in Romans 8, nonetheless pertains to both natural Israel and spiritual Israel. They both have a form of redemption. 
National Israel has a physical redemption from physical bondage, slavery into a physical promised land. Took God 40 years in the wilderness to prepare them for faith to follow him into the promised land where he was going to do it all for them. But it took 40 years to, pure up, uh, to purify the nation of Israel of the mixed multitude and all those that uh, would not follow uh, God into the promised land because there was just too, too much resistance there. So God purified them. They all died in the wilderness. So the next 38 years after Kadesh Barnea is a funeral march every day where thousands of, of Jews are dying uh, for 38 years. You've got to figure out how many that takes in a lot of them. So <clears throat> National Israel had a physical redemption. Spiritual Israel has spiritual redemption. In Israel's physical redemption, God's presence, the glory, his Shekinah, went before them. The glory is part of God's promises to both national Israel and spiritual Israel. God led national Israel throughout the wilderness journey, uh, journey with a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. Was it visible? Was it visible? Was it visible? Yes. That's why it was physical. Physical things for physical Israel. Now, we already read this morning that, you know, the wind bloweth where it, where it listeth and we can't see it. So is the Spirit of God. The Spirit of spiritual redemption we don't see. It's not visible to us. Not like this, Jekyll. Exodus 13, 21. And the Lord went before them by day and a pillar of a cloud, visible, physical, to lead them uh, the way, to lead them the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. They could travel both ways. Physical. He took not away the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. There was a physical presence of God. And we know the spiritual presence of God is here today. How do we know that? By faith. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. God promises that. We know it by faith. How do we know we're saved? By faith. How do we know that we have been uh, received the Spirit? By faith. It's spiritual. We can't see it. We know it there. Now, that's what we read this morning. You know, the wind bloweth where it will. We, don't, we can't see it, but it's there. We know it's there. So the Shekinah was a manifestation of the presence of the Holy Spirit of God in the Old Testament for both national and spiritual Israel. For both national, the, those who were born again, they knew it too. The people who were only physically redeemed, they, they knew it. But prior to Pentecost, the Spirit of God was with Israel in the Shekinah and through the anointing of the prophets, priests, and kings. After the day of Pentecost, the Shekinah, the Spirit of God, <clears throat> now dwells in all believers and leads them with truth. How do we know? Well, if you're saved, you know. You can't live in sin. The Spirit of God won't leave you alone. You'll know chastisement. You know, you'll know that the Spirit of God is leading you if you're generally supported born again. You'll have a hunger for the Word of God. Because now you're a spiritual being, you're going to be hungry for spiritual things. If you don't have a hunger for spiritual things, you probably should get back to the cross and re-examine yourself, see if you're being faith. You're going to have conviction of sin. The Spirit of God's not going to leave you alone. You sin, he's going to convict you of that sin, and you're going to know that it's conviction. And if you don't repent, you're going to have chastisement for sin. Now, if those things aren't evident in your life, then you probably should get back to the cross and make sure you're part of the faith. <clears throat> now, there are a lot of other things we can look at here. So, this is another aspect of the believer's adoption relating to sonship and moving those born again of the Spirit one step closer to the regeneration. That's what glorification is. Romans 8, 14 says this, For as many as are what? What's that say up there? As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, every child of God is being led by the Spirit of God. 
if you're not being led by the Spirit of God, you're not a son of God, not a child of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, again, placement as adult children, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, this new relationship. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. Otherwise, the Spirit of God in us is bearing testimony with our spirit that we're the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs, of course, with Christ, sharing in the primogeniture of Christ as the last Adam. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together with Christ. He's already glorified. He is the first, first, first fruits of the first resurrection. We are the second fruits of the rapture. And the third fruits, fruits of the first resurrection, or the third stage of that, is the martyred saints of the tribulation. Uh, who will be resurrected, and they too will be added to the church and rule with Christ during that time. So there's three phases of the first resurrection. It says in Revelation that this is the first resurrection, or the completion of it. Now the next thing, Romans 9, 4 says, that pertaineth to the Israelites, both national Israelites and spiritual Israelites, is the covenants. Now covenants here is plural. Because it refers to God's progressive revelation in the seven folds of the Abrahamic covenant. <clears throat> so in this we have the Mosaic covenant was added to the Abrahamic covenant. We have the Davidic covenant that was uh, added to the Abrahamic covenant. We have the Palestinian covenant which is an explanation further and given greater details of the land promises of God to Israel. And we have the new covenant which is in Christ Jesus and his blood which thereby abrogates the Mosaic Covenant and the sacrifice of the blood. So all of these things are important. We wouldn't understand Romans 9, 10, and 11 if we don't understand these things. So obviously we've already detailed the Abrahamic Covenant provides both earthly and temporal promises to national Israel and heavenly and eternal promises to spiritual or born-again Israel. We don't need to go over that again. So the giving of the law and the service are related. The law refers to all aspects of God's ordained governance of national and spiritual Israel. The law refers to the moral laws. That's one part of the law. The, the ceremonial ritual laws, including the holy days, feast days of the law. That's the second part. And the third part is the civil governance of a king and a high priest. That's the third part of the law. Now, I don't believe that the sacrifices are going to be reinstated during the Millennial Kingdom, but I believe the ceremonial aspects of the law, holy days, and uh, the governance of the law, is civil aspects of the law, is going to be reinstated during the Millennial Kingdom. Now, some people believe sacrifices will be reinstated in the Millennial Kingdom. I, have, I will struggle with that, but I don't know why. Uh, there, that may be true. Now, some aspects of all these things become part of the new covenant and will continue under the millennial kingdom. We know that from Ezekiel chapter 37 through uh, 48, a pretty extensive portion of scripture. You go and study that in the prophecy of it. Now, although the promises, Romans 9, 5, to the fathers, as the Jewish patriarchs, can refer to the promises within the Abrahamic covenant, to some degree it does, the primary aspect of the promises to the Father refers to the incarnation of Messiah and all that he would accomplish. So the prom all the promises relate to all that Jesus would finish in his redemption, his work of redemption. Literally translated that, who is God over all? Jesus, who is God over all. So the restoration of dominion to mankind through the incarnation of God in the flesh that is the ultimate purpose of God's election of both national and spiritual Israel. There would be a holy lineage through which Messiah would be born. He would be the Redeemer, Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. It would be through national Israel that Christ would be born, opening the door then for believers to enter the regeneration through spiritual rebirth. Otherwise, the promise of national Israel have no purpose whatsoever if it does not fulfill and culminate in the birth of the Messiah, the promised one, who then can provide spiritual 
rebirth to Israel. So, this is a regeneration. Now, once God was actually propitiated, not just positionally in the promised one, but he was actually propitiated, it is finished on the cross, his wrath upon sin was adjudicated through the death of the sinless one. Christ took our sins in his body and bore the penalty of that sin, the wrath of God upon that sin. Believers could be actually regenerated, and God could once again, actually, not just positionally, breathe into them the breath of life, and they could once again, actually, not just positionally, become living souls. Until then, we were dead in trespasses and sin, as the Old Testament would say, we were saved on credit, put on layaway until that which was uh, the, that which was could be set straight. And Christ did that in His death, burial, and resurrection. So the firstborn into the regeneration is the incarnate, resurrected Son of God, who is Jesus, humanity's last Adam, thereby creating the Church of the firstborn. Uh, Hebrews 12.23, and all church-age born-again believers. What do we say to all this? Amen, <laughs> hallelujah, praise God. I don't think we really comprehend many times the wonders of God's gift of salvation. Now, I know many times these are just, these are just words. They just seem like words. And after listening to them for a while, I know how difficult and how laborious it is. But these are wonderful things. And sometimes as all of these facts begin to develop, as you study the scriptures and you begin to pull out this nugget here and this nugget there, you come to the place and you just, wow. This is what my God has done for me. Because he loves me. And it really defines the love of God, not just a fire escape from hell. So much more. I can understand why I believe the Apostle Paul when he says in the book of Hebrews, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So great a salvation. They're more than just words. They're the inspired words of God. To communicate to us truths that are so far beyond us that God has to belabor us to get us to really look at them and study. Oh, it's laborious to, to dig all of this stuff out. I watched a show the other day of these two guys working in an old, old opal mine. And they had the what they called the old timers, you know, back a hundred years ago, they'd gone through this opal mine and they'd taken all the big opals out. And anything that was little stuff, they just threw it in the hole. Now these two guys, they come down to this old opal mine and they're digging all these opals out, these little bitty pieces. And these little pieces now that were just thrown away a hundred years ago, now are worth thousands of dollars. He says the old timers didn't even realize how valuable this would be one day if they'd have just saved it. They could have put it in their pockets and saved it, given it to their grandchildren, and their grandchildren would be millionaires. But they were just little pieces of junk that they just threw away. I think that is so much of what the Bible is to most people today. They get the doctrine of salvation and maybe not even spend much time on that. They want to just study the Bible just enough to get fire escape from hell and then never get any more. All the wealth of what God has given us is so great a salvation. But we can never truly worship God and truly appreciate and praise him for what he has given us if we do not understand what that is. That's Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. So much. I hope you're born again today. I hope you have not neglected so great a salvation. It's not enough to understand all these things if you don't do anything with it. You must repent, believe, confess, call, and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. You must. 
It's not enough just to know it. You have to do what God wants you to do with it. Be born again today. Our Father, as we bow and close this time together, we thank you for the opportunity to share these wondrous truths. They're your truths of what you've done and what you will do. And for them, we are eternally grateful. I mean, literally, we will be eternally grateful. But only then, in eternity, will we really fully comprehend them. Thank you, Father, for being who you are and your love and grace to us. In Jesus' name, amen.